What have we got? Messier 61. Gorgeous. Isn't that a pretty one? We've saved up some of the good ones. It's a barred spiral galaxy. It's in the Virgo cluster, so it's about how far the Virgo cluster is away. 50 million light years, that kind of distance away. It's a bit unusual because the Virgo cluster, because it's a relatively rich cluster of galaxies, that's quite good at stripping the gas out of a lot of its galaxies. But as you can just actually see from the image here, this is a galaxy which has got a lot of gas because there's lots of star formation going on in it. And you only really get star formation where, you know, if you've got a gas rich galaxy. And there's all sorts of features that you can see, like these, for example, these dust lanes are associated with the orbits of the material in the bar here where the orbits get distorted in such a way that you end up bringing lots of gas together in these kind of weird spirally features which, which where you see this dust obscuration where a whole load of gas has all been shot together. There are two clear indicators of star formation in this picture. One are the blue bits and the blue bits are just where there are bright young stars that are formed because the blue stars are the massive stars and the massive stars have very short lifetimes which means wherever you see blue light that's telling you stars have formed very recently which almost certainly means stars are still forming there. And then the other indication of star formation are a lot of these kind of pink bits and these are these things called H2 regions where there is a very, very bright star which is actually ionising the gas uh, around it, so it's very much exciting the gas around it and causing the hydrogen gas around it to glow with this kind of characteristic reddish colour. A couple of features here. One is if you look at the bar itself, it actually looks slightly redder in colour and there aren't any of these big pink regions in it. So there's not a huge amount of star formation going on in the bar and that's a common feature of bar galaxies. In the bars themselves, they tend not to actually have that much star formation. And the other feature is at the very ends of the bar, you can see this kind of collection of, of pinky red bits, which are these indications of very strong star formation going on there. It's less clear at the other end. Maybe out here you can see something, but you tend to see star formation in, sometimes enhanced at the ends of the bars. And so one of the questions has been in astronomy is, why is that the case? Why is it that within the bar you tend not to see very much star formation outside the bar? Lots of star formation and sometimes there's hey, this enhancement right at the ends of the bar as well. And there's kind of two possibilities. One is that maybe whatever the process is that drives star formation just doesn't work so well within a bar. So, you know, maybe it's, you know, you need to have a particular kind of orbit or a particular set of things going on and for whatever reason you don't find that in the barred regions of galaxies. The second possibility is maybe there just isn't the raw material, right? That maybe there's just loads of gas outside the bar and not very much gas inside the bar. Can't make stars if you haven't got the gas to make the stars out of in the first place. And so I have a paper from a couple of years ago called CO Multiline Imaging of Nearby Galaxies, blah, 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 blah. The star formation in the bar spiral galaxy NGC 4303, which is actually just another name for Messier 61. So they're looking at Messier 61 and they're observing molecular gas, so carbon monoxide in this case, to study how much material there is to see whether or not the reason that stars are or aren't forming in these different regions is because of the amount of raw material or whether there's something else going on. Professor, why wouldn't they be looking at hydrogen? I thought hydrogen was the key gas for star formation. So if you want to form stars, you need cold gas, right? Because hot gas doesn't kind of collapse down. So you need cold gas, which probably means you need molecular gas. So the molecule you'd really like to look at is molecular hydrogen because that's what most of the universe is made of, that's what most of the stars are made of. Molecular hydrogen has this irritating feature that it doesn't actually have any features, or at least one, not, none that we can actually observe very easily. It's to do with, you have to talk to a chemist about this, not me, but it's to do with the fact that it's, it's a symmetric molecule, because you've got two hydrogen atoms, and that means that there are modes of excitement that don't happen in hydrogen because it has this symmetry about it. Whereas carbon monoxide, because it's got a carbon and an oxygen, it's nicely asymmetric, which means you get a whole load more features, which means it's much easier to observe. The hope is that if you observe carbon monoxide, that's telling you about molecules. And if there's carbon monoxide molecules, there's probably hydrogen molecules as well. It's a slightly dodgy thing to do, but, it, but nonetheless, uh, CO is often used as kind of a tracer for, for hydrogen, for molecular hydrogen, because we can actually observe it where we can't observe the molecular hydrogen. So they observed, they made maps of this thing in CO, in carbon monoxide. And again, it turns out life is quite complicated in that if you look at normal CO, which is like normal carbon and normal oxygen, there's so much of it that actually it becomes what's known as optically thick. It's like looking at a, a star, right? When you look at a star, you only see the surface layers. You don't see right through, down to the middle. It's the same with this. If you're observing normal carbon monoxide, you kind of only see the outer layers. And that's not helpful if you're trying to figure out how much of it there is, because you don't know whether it's that much or that much, right? Because you only see in the front bit. So actually, because it's optically thick, you can't see through it. So it's not terribly easy to translate from the observations to the amount of actual carbon monoxide, and then hence how much molecular material it is. Fortunately, there's another isotope of carbon carbon-13 instead of carbon-12, which is much rarer, rarer. And because it's a different isotope, that means that the carbon 
atom weighs a slightly different amount, that means that the lines, the things that get excited as it jiggles around, are at different wavelengths. So you can see the carbon-13 differently from the carbon-12. So you can see carbon monoxide, which is made of carbon-13 and oxygen, as, as well as carbon-12 and oxygen. Because it's so much rarer, there's much less emission from it, and you don't run into this problem of it being optically thick. You can actually see right through. So in principle, carbon-13 and oxygen gives you a nice measure of how much actual molecular material there is. There's one final complication, as if we didn't have enough of it already, which is what you actually observe, of course, is the intens intensity of emission not the total mass of stuff. So if, for example, supposing the, the transition that you were seeing wasn't being excited at all, you wouldn't see anything. So there could be a whole load of carbon monoxide there, but you wouldn't see a thing. Um, and so you need to know, OK, so how much is this stuff being excited? If the thing were in thermodynamic, thermodynamic equilibrium, in other words, if it had a kind of a well-defined temperature, it turns out you can do that calculation. We don't think these things are in thermodynamic equilibrium, so it's kind of hard to figure out what kind of temperature it is, how excited it will be. So what the guys did in this paper is they did this stuff called non-LTE, non-local thermodynamic equilibrium calculations, where they used both those 12 CO observations, so the normal carbon monoxide, and the 13 CO observations, combined them together, and it turns out that if you make a few assumptions about what's going on in terms of how far you are from thermodynamic equilibrium, that's enough to translate it into the mass. Basically, what they've been able to do by making these molecular observations of carbon monoxide are figuring out how much molecular material there is in this galaxy. And what they found when they look at the different regions of the galaxy is in the middle region here, where star formation is suppressed by about 30% relative to a bit further out, there's 30% less molecular material. At the ends of the bar, where star formation is a bit enhanced by 20 or so percent, there's about 20% more molecular hydrogen. So it looks like the thing that's really driving whether or not you see star formation isn't anything fancy about the star formation process. It's actually whether you've got the raw material there in the first place. You just haven't got the gas. Yeah, you can't. If you haven't got the gas, you can't make the stars. Well, you know what my next question is. What's that then? Why is there not much gas in the bar? So the other piece of information you get out of these observations, because you're looking at an emission line, not only does that tell you how bright it is and so far this very convoluted argument how much there is of the material, but because there's a Doppler shift in it, depending on whether that material is coming towards you or going away from you, you can actually figure out the motions of this gas. And so they were able to see whether the motions of gas were systematically different in the regions where there's less molecular gas or whether there's more molecular gas. And the quantity they measure is some measure of how much random motion there is in this gas. What you find is where there's little random motion, there's not much molecular material. Then as you start going up in random motions, you get more molecular material. Then when you go up a bit further in random motions, you get less again. We're doing the Goldilocks thing again, right? You need it just right. If there's too little random motion, then actually you don't squeeze things together, you don't make molecular gas, so you're not gonna make stars. If there's too much random motion, it turns out then probably the collisions are too energetic so that things don't merge together. They just kind of bounce off each other. And so actually you don't end up making the kind of big molecular clouds you need to make stars there either. You need things just right somewhere in the middle. So what's going on in the bar? So there's probably quite a lot of gas in the bar, but because the orbits are very distorted in a bar, you have very some kind of shear. So you have big differences between one bit of gas and the next bit of gas. And that means that they're actually moving at high speeds relative to each other. And that generally means that actually that they're, they're moving too fast to, to smash together to create these molecular clouds. So the gas isn't even getting to the molecule phase. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Almost certainly too turbulent. And some places it could be just not turbulent enough, but I think in the bar it's probably because it's too turbulent because there's just so much of this kind of shearing motion. 169, I think, is 6,200 light years from the galactic centre in comparison to our solar system, which is like 25,000 light years away.